Thank you for that excellent talk. There, usually wars are a much more solemn subject than it's going to sound. Now I'm going to sound positively flippant in comparison to that. Um, so, there we go. I'll just, if you could just set me up there. There we are. Yep, lovely. Okay, archiving at the sharp end or what an archivist does when deployed into the Middle East region, or the Mur as defence call it. Firstly, I'll dispel any illusions that I was anywhere near the fighting when I was deployed last year. It's never been the archivist's role. I'm not Indiana Jones. Anyway, he's an archaeologist, not an archivist. I'm also not a Blade Runner. I know, I've, because I've passed the Voigt-Kampf test. I clearly remember it, or at least I think they're my memories for those of you who know what I'm referring to. <laughs> Which is important because in this talk, I will look as much to the past as to the future. Last year, I was part of a joint deployment of representatives from the Defence History Units in the Australian War Memorial to the Middle East. The deployment took place as three separate groups. One went with the Army to Iraq, one with the Navy on the frigate HMAS Newcastle, which sailed around the Indian Ocean, and the other, with the Air Force, visited a range of Air Force bases in the Gulf states. It was with this Air Force group that I was based, okay, which comprised five people, two from the Australian War Memorial, two from the Royal Australian Air Force, and one was an official war artist who was contracted to the AWM to produce 10 artworks while they were with us. During the three weeks I, weeks I spent deployed, I visited three different bases in the Gulf area where Australians were employed on a range of activities. So anyway, here I am looking like your average archivist with my cardi and horn rim glasses. Oh, okay. So I look a little different than your average archivist in that picture. Perched on the wing of an F-18F Super Hornet at an undisclosed base somewhere in the Mur wearing King G's and a pair of blops. The blops are the sunglasses there. Defence has to have an acronym for absolutely everything and these sunglasses they call blops, which stands for Ballistic Laser Optical Protection System. But none of this really explains why I or anyone else from the memorial should, should be there in the Middle East in a conflict zone. So it's not unusual for the memorial to send staff to conflict zones. In most years, the memorial sends curators off with defence history units somewhere that Australian forces are deployed. What was unusual was this time, was we, it was the first time in five years we had sent an archivist. Usually it's all about taking photos, recording oral histories and identifying objects for the memorial may be interested in acquiring. And I certainly did all those things while I was there. But in addition, I used it as an opportunity to look at how records were being generated in operations, both officially and in a private sense, and also to see how people were staying in touch with their loved ones in an era of high-tech communications. Perhaps I should go back to the start and place this, all of this activity into historical context. In May 1917, the Australian War Records Section was formed in London with the initial purpose of collecting records that would allow the official historian of the First World War, Charles Bean, to write that history. It was the actions of Charles Bean that resulted in the creation of the Australian War Records Section. However, it fell to a young lieutenant, John Trelaw, to form and run that section. He wasn't given much help in scope, as can be seen here from a transcript of his meeting with General Brudenell White. I'll just give you a moment to read that. Okay, that is the transcript in its complete form. <laughs> Some meetings are shorter than others. However, regardless of this lack of specific direction, John Trelaw proved to be the right man for the job. Not only did he set up a series of instructions that improved the quality and quantity of war diaries that were being created, but he also ran the Australian War Records section so efficiently that by the end of 1917, all collecting of relics and photographs for a future war museum had been transferred to under their care. Eventually, it was the key staff of the Australian War Records section that was to transform into the staff of the embryonic Australian War Museum and then later the Australian War Memorial. 
That's them in France, or some of their members in France. However, Trelaw had realised early on that you can't just send out instructions to commanders asking them to provide relics or improve their war diaries and just expect it to happen. The real success of the Australian War Record Section was due to liaison. Trelaw set up subsections in both France and Egypt where members would liaise with frontline units and coordinate the collecting effort. He also arranged liaison with staff officers who were visiting AIF headquarters London. This liaison work proved most productive and the way it worked was an Australian War Records Section officer would talk to their counterparts, explain the purposes of the future war museum that was to be built. They would advise that everyone's contributions were required to make it a world-class museum and then they would explain the value of a well-written war diary and advise what relics should be collected. The Australian War Records Section officer would then leave that officer with, with a bundle of collecting labels and through this method, records and relics came rolling in in large quantities. Here's a nice photo showing a month's worth of war diaries created for a month in 1916 versus a month in 1918. The amount of the units in the field during both those periods was pretty much the same. You can see how by 1918, the work they'd done through 1917 had paid a lot of dividends in improving the amount of records that were being generated. Let's contrast this to the British experience. Whereas in early 1918, the Australian War Records section was led by a captain, Trelaw had been promoted by then, the British appointed a major general as the Inspector General of War Trophies. For those of you who don't know army ranks, that's the difference between me, a lowly curator, and Brendan Nelson, the director of the War Memorial and Levels. The Inspector of War Trophies had been ap appointed for the purpose of collecting relics for a future Imperial War Museum. In contrast, the Australian War Records section, uh, the, the approach that we used, the Inspector of War Trophies relied on the standard approach of putting in place a, seri a series of written procedures and orders advising units how to collect items. All standard stuff we had also done, but without the personal touch and with the liaison. And guess which approach worked? Okay, it seems by 1917, people were sick of just the endless orders they were receiving all the time and largely ignored what they were told by the Inspector of War Trophies. And the British had a hard time collecting relics before the war ended. However, when the war did end, the disbanding units swamped them with units as they came back from France. Now, luckily for the Imperial War Museum, that approach worked for Britain. It's not how they wanted it to work, but it worked for them because they were close to France. Okay? They could play the long game and then catch up. Okay? For Australia, being far from home, we needed to do our collecting there and then before everyone caught a ship home. It's that tyranny of distance thing for anyone who's experienced travel overseas. And it's this tyranny of distance, to quote Professor Geoffrey Blaney, that's defined the Australian character. It's also continued to define Australian involvement in conflicts. Because of our isolation, we often deploy troops far from home. So the approach created by the Australian War Records Section is still as relevant today as it was 100 years ago. That is, getting out there, talking to the troops on the ground and advising them what we require. It worked in the First World War and it still works today. And it needs to because unfortunately once our units have left operational areas, it's usually too late and the opportunity to collect anything is gone. So, to the actual deployment I did last year. We've established an approach from where the memorial goes out into the field has benefits. It has a history of having worked in the past and it's something memorial was keen to do more of today. Also, from an archivist's perspective, we want to have a say in how the records we will eventually hold are being generated. So, how did I end up in the Middle East and what did I find there? Bit of a mixed message on that T-wall, I think, but <laughs> such is life. To very quickly jump through the process of what I had to do. After being asked if I wanted to go overseas, I attended several training courses run by Defence, had thorough medical and dental checkups for obvious reasons. They don't want you deploying if you have any major ongoing medical issues. Then you go to the travel doctor and get turned into a human pincushion. 
with many, many inoculations. Luckily, I'd been to Vietnam only a few years ago, so I got away with only three extra needles. And then an extra one when I arrived in the Middle East, just to be sure. I got issued a very generous amount of clothing and equipment, only of half of which you actually need when you're going to a desert. Then I flew into the Middle East and got to do most of the training all over again. For example, you may learn how to tourniquet your left arm above the elbow using only your right hand to simulate having had your arm blown off. All very cheery stuff to learn and completely useful for an archivist who has to deal with paper cuts on a regular basis. <laughs> then once you are actually at the airbases, you can start looking for the things to collect, plus looking for their records, processes, etc. This a lot involved a lot of visiting with various deployed units. We conducted oral histories where appropriate. I conducted 65 oral histories in three weeks. You also sit down and chat to service personnel, take notes from them. You look at a lot of technology in quotes there. That's because I realised that technology from the AWM's point of view is military technology. I mean planes, guns, vehicles, things like that. Okay, so the rest of the, whenever I use the word technology for the rest of the, the talk, I'll be talking about ICT technology. Okay, there are also a lot of artworks created by service personnel. For example, have a look at these. These are art panels created by the EAOU, which is Expeditionary Air Base Operations Unit which are a small unit of aircraft support and logistics personnel. Now imagine the problems of repatriating some of these, such as the one with the flying camel, which is drawn directly onto the metal walls of the shed. See the one there with the pirate ship? That was the newest one they were, they were just making while we were there. And if you look at them across time, possibly hard to see because they don't all have the dates on them, there is an obvious evolution of the complexity of the artworks over time that they're making. The vast number of art panels that exist also shows that the conflicts have been going on for a long time and that the units deployed are there for only a short amount of time. If we look at the op catalyst one on the bottom right, there it is, that's 03 to 04. So we're talking about things which are up to 15 years old. This is how long the conflict's been going and we've had units deployed to these areas. Okay, well, if we also look at it, we notice that they're only there for five or six months at a time. That's a very common thing now. You don't get people deploying for five years to war zones. They deploy in very short periods, anywhere from three to six months, sometimes to 12 months is a tour nowadays. Uh, some of those plaques also identified the names of personnel. You'll notice I've blurred those out on there. So, so I don't get in trouble with the defence. Inevitably, I spent some time around the RAAF personnel and got the chance to take in their culture and ways of approaching operations, also how they spend their downtime, how they communicate with home, and more on that aspect shortly. Eventually, if you're an archivist, you want to see all the records. And after three weeks searching, I found them, and here they are. There we go. Whoops. Okay. Uh, here they are. That's better. Okay. <laughs> Right, how did that get in there? Okay. There I am with the theatre archivist, a nice fellow who was more appropriately a retention disposal officer as his duties really involved just sentencing and destruction of a lot of forms. Okay, though he did an occasional bit of identifying of archival material, which was great to see. All of these records in the picture, in the shipping container there, were just forms that were being sentenced for destruction. The mass shipping containers were a thing of a past. They were all scanned and removed about four years ago. There was a period where they had about eight shipping containers full of records, but they had a digitisation project, digitise them and destroy the originals, repatriated the scans back to Australia. Nowadays, there's a policy of scanning physical material immediately and registering it into the electronic systems. Loose paper is becoming a thing of the past, especially in a security conscious environment where you're provided with instructions such as when in drought, when in doubt, shred. That worried me when I saw that. Because almost all of the archival documents are electronic, I met with both the information manager and also the theatre information manager. 
and discuss electronic systems used in the operational area. Of course, there have been some teething problems with the electronic systems they have been working through, as in any department. We've all experienced them, and rather than be critical, as I was in the Middle East, perhaps I should say, let the organisation that is without sin cast the first stone. I was happy to hear, though, they'd undertaken some training through the NAA. Though due to the method of staff defence staff rotation, there are no professional information managers or archivists who deploy. Technology has touched all the areas, including others such as ephemera and private records. Examine these two motorsports. The safety board on the left is full of documentations. That's because they are required to be there by policy and legislation. And then notice the right-hand social notice board. Okay, there's a lot of blank spaces where there used to be notices and only a couple of lonely notices up there. I checked with the public relations people to see if they were creating a newsletter, but that finished two years ago. Eventually, I did track down a different sort of newsletter that's placed on the back of toilet doors for people to read. I guess not. That one was produced by the security staff as a way of promoting information. So the reality is not much ephemera is being created in the field in a physical form anymore. Private records were even more problematic. Whereas in the past conflicts, we could rely on a steady stream of diaries, letters, and postcards to fill our private records collection. Technology has made that stream run dry. The first thing most people do when they arrive at a new airbase is to go to the IT section and get personal access to the wireless network. Whereas before people had to wait a week or more to communicate with their loved ones via a letter, Skype and messenger services have made it possible to keep in almost continu continuous contact with people back in Australia. One of the officers assigned to escort us told me how he'd attended his granddaughter's birthday via an iPad, where he was able to watch his granddaughter blow out the candles of a cake while she was back in Australia. And these stories are lovely, but unfortunately, they're not being captured in any long-term media. A few people had sent parcels home with letters in them, but they were almost always so their children had something to pin up on the wall or on the fridge. Okay? They weren't being used as a primary form of communication. Out of the 65 people I interviewed, only one was keeping a diary. Another had kept a diary on a previous deployment, but no longer bothered. And who can blame anyone for using these technologies to stay in touch? They're so convenient and instant. None of these human interactions is being caught in any meaningful way that can be archived. The term lost like tears in the rain comes to mind. So what did I learn and was the trip of value? Well, simply, lots and absolutely. But more particularly, what I learned was able to inform a range of discussions we held back at the memorial we have a group there called the Operational Records Working Group, which is a quarterly meeting we hold of key defence records and archives staff and information managers, the National Archives and Memorial staff to facilitate records transfer. It allows us some small level of influence into defence records policy, and as a result of the trip, a working group has been set up to improve the creation of commander's diaries on operations. Also, the possibility of having key defence staff with information management or archival responsibilities attend the memorial prior to deploying has been discussed. And of course, there will be more visits by archivists to operational units in the future. So in conclusion, in a Blade Runner age of high technology, where battles are being fought with high-tech weapons and records recorded digitally, it's problematic to go around looking for records. I did find some, but I found a lot of other things have faded to obscurity, such as letters homes, diary supplanted by Messenger and Skype. Human interactions with technology have become problematic. Here's a fellow curator on deployment there experiencing major IT problems. He's sitting there filming his watch as it took 15 minutes for the, the laptop that our IT section had given to us to boot up. The highlights, this, sorry, this highlights the interesting thing I found while on deployment. That is, in a Blade Runner age, it is the human element that is the most important because the technology often fails you. 
face-to-face -face contact and liaison has never been more important. It's 100 years since the Australian War Records se uh, section went to France helping service, helping service personnel improve their war diaries and telling them what relics needed collecting. Similarly, it is these human skills of talking to service personnel today which is the best hope to ensure records exist for us to collect into the future. As technology increases, it is ironic that it is our human characteristics that are our most important assets in a high-tech Blade Runner age. Thank you.